increasing concentration of wealth in our society, and things are hard on the middle class. And so, in that context, people who are marked for discrimination and stigma in some way are squeezed right out. And we see it in their access to all the basics, housing, employment, and income, um, right on through. So. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure you don't have to, as you're looking for housing for people in your communities or even healthcare, I'm sure that most of you have experienced this when you're standing alongside one, someone who has had, is having difficult problems and we know if we could just get them housed, as I say, I don't know if they're crazy, why don't we get them a place first and then see what happens next because people need to kind of settle down. I don't know if you've ever tried to live without housing, I've done it briefly a few times, but it is um, extremely difficult. And um, I think the only other comment I'd make is that there's a real kind of resentment of poor people getting anything now that the middle class can't get anything. And I live in a housing co-op and I'm paying $518 for a two bedroom. And um, just saying, because it's because of my income so low. And I, I used to tell people that all the time. I don't dare tell anyone in Vancouver that. It's like uh, some kind of hostility. You know what I mean? They're really pissed. And because, um, anyway, I'm just saying, um, I notice my own behavior changes because I don't, I just don't need their hostility. And it's so weird because what we don't get is the unity. You know, I'm looking for the professors who now claim they're working for less than minimum wage, and I believe them. I think they are. I'm saying, come on down. You can help us out. We're trying to organize welfare recipients because uh, it'd be nice to have a diverse group of people working together in unity. But I think um, it's, it, as she said, I think it's making it worse. And not, not with everyone. Other people, I think, are really seeing their free fall from middle class life down as a time to really unify and create social justice movements. So it's not true of everyone. Um, and then another impact of stigma and discrimination is around reduced access to healthcare services. So I wanted to tell a story from some of my clinical work, which was um, being on the wards with and meeting a young woman who was coming into hospital because of uh, sexual assault and because she had a soft tissue infection. And the, on knowing that she was a person who used drugs, the person who was the chief person in charge of her care said to her, oh, I heard you got a little bit taken advantage of. Um, her pain was in overwhelmingly undertreated. I mean, she was a person who had a dependence and a tolerance to opioids and so needed higher doses than the average person and that was deferred to a pain service that wasn't available for hours and this young woman needed to stay in hospital for seven days to receive an appropriate course of antibiotics and who could blame her that she left after three days? Who could blame her if she didn't come back the next time she had a problem? Um, we also see it with addiction treatment and how it reduces access to services for addiction treatment. I mean, this is partly that people who have managed to hide their drug use have so much to lose by discussing it. Maybe not to an addiction professional, but to their regular physician, to family and friends, um, to people who it's disclosed already, there's still incredible stigma. And then the last thing I wanted to say was um, about the overdose response and how that how stigma plays into people not accessing services there. We talk a lot about people in uh, private residences as facing stigma and that's why they don't call for help in the event of an overdose or why they don't access overdose prevention sites in places where there are. And that's true. And it is because they, they there is uh, a fear of judgment and that side of things, but there are also powerful economic incentives at play. So if people are going to lose access to their housing, if people are going to lose access to other services that they depend on, that is that is through stigma, but it is another path where there's real economic consequences. There's a young woman who comes to uh, Vandu and she came for years and years and used our um, smoke room. So Vandu always had this bathroom that we said, oh, well, what people do in our bathroom is private. And it has the only room with a vent. And so they smoked rock in there. They've been smoking rock in there for, I think, 15 years or something. I don't know how long we've been in that building. Anyway, um, she would not, um, you know, she, I would, came, she's very middle class looking. She smokes her drugs. She became addicted through a pain um, injury, an injury she had. And she will not go on methadone. She will not go to a doctor. And she won't go to anywhere. And um, because she said, as soon as I get labeled an addict, I'm never going to be able to get pain meds again. 
And I think she's correct uh, from the anecdotes I've seen. I don't know what your town's like, but if for some reason, if you're in pain and you've ever had even an alcohol addiction, um, you're, they'll give you um, ibuprofen or, you know what I mean, they give you uh, not opiates for sure. So um, it's, a, it's a real, and it, it's difficult because as uh, Mark pointed out, they don't give you physiotherapy either. It's um, now not covered by our healthcare system. They cover $23 or a $50 appointment, and you're supposed to take the rest out of your food money if you're on um, assistance. So it's virtually um, impossible for people to get alternate therapies for pain, which we know work. So it's a it's a real um, uh, people are boxed in. There's no way out for them other than this kind of trajectory to overdose after overdose or. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, we, when people die, I often think that they there's something to uh, they don't really take care of themselves. I'm calling it um, uh, reckless drug use, and I think reckless drug use is a sign of self hatred and and people taking on this kind of uh, hatred from society. So the question that comes up then is, but doesn't it work? Doesn't uh, addressing people negatively for their drug use cause them to change because they would like to have our approval. And to that I say, the, I'll speak to the research, which is that there's a resounding no, that people do best when they're, they feel a sense of connection and uh, are able to be vulnerable and then set their own goals and work towards achieving those goals. And those goals might not be the same as ours as health professionals. Um, but if we can, listen to them and follow them and value those goals, that we can uh, achieve successes for them and build on those successes. Um, I'll say that the research shows that recovery is most likely when people haven't lost everything. That they don't, this myth of the rock bottom is just that, it's a myth. The people who do best have access to friends and family to support them and income and a place to live. Um, and I'm going to give a counter example of how people are treated in different parts of the healthcare system. So I spent some time on the foot and ankle surgery service. So the, the people who are so specialized in surgery that they only look at feet. Um, and there was a young man there who had a tendon injury to his leg and he needed surgery. And they moved heaven and earth to get this guy surgery because they said, if we do this while he's been only off work for a short period of time, while it has had minimal disruption to his family and his ability to look after his kids and his relationship with his wife, we can help this guy to for the rest of his life. We can fix his foot and he will be able to contribute to the rest of it. You know, there was no well, actually, he needs to hit rock bottom and be the worst his foot could possibly be. This guy is really going to learn. Um, so, and that's what I wanted to say about the myth of rock bottom. So, we're going to do one uh, more little activity, and this is about your your personal journey. So, we talked at first about when you were young and the messages you first heard about drug use and people who use drugs. This is about as you started your career or as you transitioned to adulthood or some other transition that's meaningful to you. How did it change from when you were young? Uh, what messages were you hearing then? And uh, what was your relationship like with people who use drugs there? So we'll take about five minutes. <laughs>
And I'm going to add to this that a lot of the time you see it made into an acronym. And I really disagree with making it into an acronym. I think that also erases a person from it and erases the idea behind it. Um, but just something to keep in mind and to experiment with uh, in your own mind. Um, the second suggestion, and these are all suggestions from the BC Center for Disease Control. Um, you can see them on our website if you're interested. Um, is to use language that reflects a medical model of substance use disorders. And this is when appropriate. Because we know that a lot of people do not have a substance use disorder. People can use drugs without having a substance use disorder. And so there are times where that is the, the right language to use, and there are times when it's not. And I'm going to say one word about um, one word about why, which is a study that was done in the States um, where they submitted to people who were PhD trained counselors identical clinical stories about someone who used drugs. And in one version of it, they got someone who was a substance abuser, and in the other, it was a person with a substance use disorder. And they asked that, so people were randomized to get one or the other, and they did a survey afterwards about how they would treat this person. And the people who got the substance abuser scored higher on their assessment of this person as personally culpable and having a moral failing, and said they would be more likely to recommend punitive action against that person. When they repeated this study with the general population, so people who didn't have mental health training, the results were even more extreme. There was even more significant difference between the groups. So it does make a difference to choose one type of language over the other. While knowing that medicalization of our problems and erasing the social and economic context of people's drug use isn't the right choice either in many circumstances. Um, so the question I think comes up out of that is that what about 12 step language? And I think there's some people in this room who have relationships with 12-step programs. Um, this is a quote that I wanted to share with you from the person who is the former director of the U.S. Office of National Drug Control Policy, who is himself a person in recovery. And he says, I'm also a person in long-term recovery, and I realize sometimes what I say is we use our 12-step language in public ways that is probably not beneficial. So what we say to each other or what we say in the context of a meeting is different than what we should be saying in public. Because people in the general public hear those words dramatically differently than someone who's sharing the same journey. And I think that speaks to ownership of words and knowing your audience. So there are some words that are not mine to say, and there are also some contexts where it's not the right language to choose. Um, the third suggestion for language is to use language that supports patient-directed recovery and promotes autonomy. Um, this is about, again, giving up some of our professional authority as deciding what is the right treatment or course of action for someone and accepting that they might opt not to go along with what we suggest. And the fourth is to avoid value-laden slang. Um, where this comes up is with um, syringes, so referring to sterile or used syringes versus clean and dirty, because by extension, then it refers to the person as clean and dirty. Um, a point that um, the, the provincial government has been making lately is that we can challenge stigma through decriminalization and that this is true even in places where there is de facto decriminalization because there is a stigma that is associated with doing something that is against the law even if police are saying actually they wouldn't arrest someone in those circumstances and I want to highlight the difference between decriminalization and legalization for anyone who's not familiar with it. Decriminalization is removing criminal penalties Legalization is having a no restrictions on the production and distribution, um, which can be a anything goes type of model or a regulated market. And of course, I'm in public health, so I'm very favorable of regulated, regulated, regulated market. Um, we're going to see how it goes with um, the uh, cannabis legislation and the legal market there. Um, but that's been done with an idea to a regulated market. So the, the, um, this comes up with um, a sort of class difference. If you're really poor, you go to jail for um, drugs. And if you're um, you know, a celebrity, you go to treatment. So um, I, I think we're all aware of that. But sometimes you don't really notice it. And then you think, oh yeah, that's true. I mean, these were done as cartoons in that way. And the second one is a similar kind of situation where um, if you can't get anything, you can still get arrested. I mean, no matter what it would appear. And um, in our neighborhood now, it's, it's um, uh, mostly people are being arrested for um, administrative crimes. So whatever they were initially charged with might be as small as a jaywalking ticket. 
but the ticket hasn't been paid. It takes about 18 months to work its way through, and a warrant will go out for their arrest. And a most, I don't know, if there, it used to be a lot of our tickets, and Van Du did a whole campaign, and, and we forced them to, well, for a few minutes to stop, and they, they forgave 800 tickets to people in our neighborhood, which was a huge victory. But anyway, um, uh, the, uh, I don't know if you know, I mean, you must be familiar with this too, you know, the shelter can be closed, uh, there could, you can call detox and there's no beds, and on and on like that. But, and this is one of the problems that we have with stigmatization with drug use, is it needs to be uh, not done this way, so. Um, I'm going to say just a couple quick words on what is evidence-based as far as anti-stigma um, campaigns and education opportunities. So people do research this. The research shows that anti-stigma campaigns can work and have a positive effect on the population. I would add that they really need to be done in consultation with people who use drugs as a valued part of the process because it is so easy to get it wrong. So this bottom one is one that came out of Vancouver Coastal Health for Overdose Awareness Day. Um, the second strategy is open conversations. So the evidence isn't for uh, lecturing um, family and friends or um, colleagues when it comes up for shaming people, but for having open conversations that are based to some extent on motivational interviewing principles. Understanding what people's motivations are, understanding where they'd like to be, and helping them to get there. Um, and then the final evidence-based um, anti-stigma strategy is targeted education for healthcare providers and students. So I know, the, I'm most familiar with the medical school, I know there's been work on this, but there's an incredible amount to be done. There's also an incredible amount to be done in hospitals and other healthcare settings. And again, involving people who use drugs in this is an essential part of it for understanding their experiences and what they need to see. Um, and then the final strategy is around supporting peer-based organizations or drug user organizations to counter stigma in a myriad of ways. So I'm gonna read you one quote um, from my work and then I'm gonna turn it over to Anne. Um, this was a participant in a small town in BC who said, it's powerful to gather. I've never heard the word drug war survivors before. I'm walking out of here today taller than when I walked in. Um, I'm, I'm doing this <laughs> conference. We got the same funding for this, the CAI money. We got $15,000. And um, I've been driving to Abbotsford for eight years for an unfunded drug user group because I got so mad that the Abbotsford City Council made an actual bylaw that it was illegal to hand out a needle in the city of Abbotsford. So after, and they did this a long time ago, a number of years went by and just as we were going to take them to court, um, they passed a bylaw that that wasn't true anymore. So here we were. Uh, anyway, it's a it's a saga and it's, um, so, um, I'm constantly distracted that uh, we're doing this uh, conference in Abbotsford now, and we asked for the, uh, the title is, drug, how do drug user groups create resilience in the community? And of course, the drug user groups do. I mean, uh, why does Van Doon let people smoke rock in their bathroom? Well, there's some practical things. They'll smoke rock everywhere in the building. They'll smoke rock in front of the building, behind the building, beside the building, and you'll have trouble with your neighbors. So why not invite them in? and manage your own things internally and, and then the people smoking the rock are able to make the decisions about the rules for smoking the rock in the bathroom, etc. You know, I just kind of, you know, come on in, but this is your problem, let's solve it together, this kind of democratic group. And that's, um, so I've been exhausted coming up here because we started having fun, trouble with the University of the Fraser Valley at the last minute who wanted to add 10 security guards and an ambulance in the, um, parking lot outside of our meeting because um, they found out drug users were coming and we've had these meetings so many times and there's never been an incident or an ambulance called anyway just saying so if I seem a little weird that's why and, um, <laughs> and it's on Tuesday um, also it's my birthday today and I was born in Nelson <laughs> My dad's a geological engineer. There was some kind of mine somewhere around here because he was in mining. That's all I know. I just got born and then we left. Anyway, um, the, 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 these are initiatives that drug users have done. Um, there's a picture up there of an of a injection site that we formed, and it was a very early project. 
um, this one. And of course, it doesn't look like anything. It's just a little storefront. And uh, it was done in the 90s. It was another huge outbreak of overdoses and HIV. And uh, so uh, we got three little grants from the Vancouver Foundation of $8,000 each. And it was a long time ago. Um, and anyway, we struggled along. The police then uh, didn't bother us at all, which wasn't true later on. But uh, the other one is a big demonstration with all the crosses. That's in the year 2000. We put 2,000 crosses in Oppenheimer Park because we thought that 2,000 people had overdosed in British Columbia between, I don't know, 1989 and um, 2000. It was astonishing. And uh, anyway, the, the rates are, were only surpassed in 2015 or 2016 in terms of the number per 100,000 in the province. I don't know if you're aware of that. It's just that the number sounded a lot smaller because it was only 350. But the population of British Columbia has just increased so much more. Um, anyway, so that number per 100,000 was the same. And this is a tent that we put at the corner of Maine and Hastings giving out needles. The needle exchange would not give out um, unlimited needles. It was one for one and they were quite strict. And then they did this other weird thing. They said, you can get seven needles three times a week, which is 21 needles a week, and that's it. And of course, this cocaine came to town, and uh, it was real cocaine. And uh, people were like, whoa, what are we gonna do? They started injecting it. It was pre-rock. Rock came in about 1997. Anyway, so the, or 98, right in there. And um, the, uh, uh, the, the AIDS was spreading, and we knew it. And when they got really mad at us about this tent, they, the, the health authority had already seen the data, and they knew that they, couldn't do much about it. So um, the police actually took the tables and charged us with, or gave us tickets for blocking pedestrian traffic. And um, you know, you struggle along in life and you make all these sacrifices. And when the, the Heather Hay, who is in charge of the sort of harm reduction, she looks down the table at the police officers at our regular Tuesday morning meeting where the police were and the drug user group and you know, Carnegie Center, you know, these people were all there. And she goes, do you always send 14 officers to give a ticket for blocking pedestrian traffic? <laughs> oh my God, they're on our side, we're gonna win. Anyway, it was a thing. The other thing that Van Du does from time to time is, we use a model of organizing, which is, what issues do you have as drug users? And you just take a lot of notes and there's a lot of discussion that goes on. The second analysis is, what is the, what is the reason for those things? You know, how, how have they just stayed and stayed and stayed? And um, that's when you get busy and do all this research and bring back stuff, like if you have trouble with the health authority, there's a health board. If you have trouble with the police, there's a police board. If you have trouble with city council giving, uh, doing something to you, there's the city council. So you figure out who's who, and we've been to, um, of course, the legislature as well. We don't do them, you know, it's a well thought out thing that goes on for a long time. You know, letters, phone calls, still no action. So you just keep ramping it up in a very systematic way. And uh, that's people's marching in the streets um, with the Van Du banner. And most of those people are dead. So, sorry. <laughs> it's true. So um, the, the, what, what happened was that Van Du got going. And we, I used this, you know, the health board actually sent me to a four-day retreat with Nicaraguans in this unheated camp in, um, you know, uh, White Rock in January, and uh, when I came out, I was just absolutely shocked that, that there was people who talked about community organizing and that there was an actual methodology to it. My mother was a community organizer, and the only thing I knew was don't let anyone out of the room without getting all their phone numbers or else set, <laughs> set the next date for the next meeting before everyone leaves, because you're going to have to tell them when the next meeting is. These really sort of practical things I understood, but um, People kept contacting us and saying, we need what you guys have, how can we do that? And Van Du has still got the same funding they had, you know, 20 years ago. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been, you know, it makes you philosophical. And if you try to be philosophical rather than bitter, um, there's other drug user groups in the world that have really gotten um, their own building and they have a weight room and then they have their education room and they have, uh, uh, a drug use museum in uh, Copenhagen, the drug use, it's, it's fascinating what you'll find elsewhere. We've never been able to kind of be recognized as people who are going to provide services. And we're given a contract for um, education, advocacy, and support. And, and then you look at a very tight group of meetings that go on. And the whole point of it is that people get their self-esteem and stigmas dropped. If it isn't, people can get a little excited. 
But, you know, the early meetings of Andu, the way I understood stigma is um, that there were, you know, things going on. We had many guests. We had the MLA, the MP, different city councillors, um, the people from the health authority board, and on it went. So we had all these guests. And we had a police officer one day, and a guy got up and he said to the police officer, I never got a meeting from the police I didn't deserve. 